สวัสดีครับคุณพ่อคุณแม่ครับทุกคนแล้วก็ต้องหลอกด้วยนะครับวันนี้ก็อาจจะมาดูสัมมนานะครับฟังสัมมนาคุณยัสมินซาวะนะครับเอาจุดเกณฑ์มีจุดชอบยูนิเวอร์ซิตี้นะครับก็คือคุณยัสมินซาวะนะครับก็คือเป็นผู้โคเคยเป็นโคฟอเดอร์ของคาดิฟซิฟอร์คอลเลจที่เป็นตัวซิฟอร์ของด้วยของอังกฤษนะครับแล้วก็เคยเคยเป็นสัมมนาเคยเป็นกรรมการสัมภาษณ์ของ UCL แล้วก็ Imperial วันนี้ก็จะมาสัมมนาก็มาทอล์ให้คุณพ่อคุณแม่ฟังว่าต้องเตรียมตัวอย่างไรบ้างถ้าสมมติอยากเข้า U ูทอของที่นั่นนะครับเดี๋ยวเชิญพบกับคุณยัสมินสตาร์วัคเลยนะครับขอบคุณครับโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไหมโอเคใช่ต้องมีอะไรใช่ไห
and then it became a top school. Um, and when I received my award, they were a bit um, challenged by the fact that there's a foreigner, a woman, who's coming to the UK and beating the likes of Westminster, Eton, Harrow, and sort of thing in terms of their A-level results. Uh, obviously, I can't beat them in tradition. <laughs> they started hundreds of years ago. Uh, but, I, but we were beating them in, in terms of A-level results. Can I also say that no one in the history of British education has achieved consecutive uh, number one position in eight years in a row. Normally, the schools will fluctuate every year. So number one, number two, number three fluctuates. No one institution maintains it. So uh, the fact that we were able to maintain it, um, there is a formula and methodology that works. And also, when we first started, when I first started uh, the college, I was recruiting non-selective students. So they weren't uh, the top students. They were students who had whatever grades uh, they can get because our students are never as selective as Westminster or Harrow and sort of thing because obviously in, in the UK, um, the Westminster school has, you know, all the students have 80 stars in their class. So that's a pretty selective school. We had students who came from different academic background and yet the outcome was the same or better. Um, in 2015, I won the Welsh Women of the Year Award. I'm not sure why they gave me this award because I'm not Welsh. But anyway, I've taken the award. Um, I also sit on interview panels for medical schools as well. I've spent 14 years of my life uh, working out the strategies of getting into university. I consider myself more than an educator, uh, more than a teacher, I consider myself as an educational strategist. Because you probably know the saying, when you buy a house, it's location, location, location. When you want to apply to university, it's strategy, strategy, strategy. Uh, that's what you need to follow. And these two years, um, between the GCSEs and between university, these two years is all about strategy. If you're looking for a school where you're going to be able to learn everything and learn every single bit and learn you know, about uh, horse riding as well as learn academic, if you want that whole um, sort of breadth of education, you should not be doing at the last two years of your education before university. You should be doing that earlier. The last two years of your education before university has to be very specific, has to be focused, has to be based on a strategy. Otherwise, you don't get where you want to go. Um, I am also, in 2015, I won the class Nobel Educator of Distinction. This is given by the Nobel family. Uh, Nobel Prize organization does not give any uh, prizes in education, but the Nobel family does. Uh, so I won this in 2015, and I was a TEDx speaker in 2016. Um, this is my university success record, so I personally assist all my students. I obviously have a team of people, but I assist all my students in terms of their university application from the very start. Every student is different, every application is different. It must not be the same because everyone is unique, everyone is different, everyone has different GCSEs and different qualifications and different strengths and weaknesses. So for me, it's very important to present the best case scenario. It's like, imagine you are presenting a meal and your content has to be good, but the, but the, the dressing has to be great as well. So you have to present them a great application. Now, in the last eight years, I have sent over 150 students to Oxford, Cambridge, London School of Economics, Imperial College, London. Over 150 students, and these are all international students. Local students, British students in, in the UK, getting into top universities um, is a lot more straightforward for them because A, the number of places are more for them, and B, they have gone to an education system that allows them to build the skills that the top universities are looking for. So these numbers that I'm quoting to you are purely international students, which makes the track record or these figures the best in the country. Medical schools, I have sent nearly 200 students. Somebody joked to, uh, with me the other day and they said I could build a mini university based on this because 200, 150 is entry for one year. So um, now, 100% of students received offers to Russell Group Universities in the UK, equivalent to Ivy League in the US. My first application to the US and the student got into Harvard. So my students currently, they apply not just in the UK, we have a system called Global Strategic Pathway. We're looking at beyond UK. So anyway, this is a little bit about myself. Uh, just so you know that uh, I, I, I think I know what I'm talking about, so hopefully that you will get some information. Um, so before I talk about OIC and sort of thing, I just wanted you to understand first of all what are top universities looking for. 
Um, and actually, we'll skip this page. We'll go to the pie chart. Okay. Now, this pie chart is very, very crucial. Now, the students who came this morning, you're probably going to get bored now because you've already heard all this. Uh, but let's see. Let's test you. Right? Let's test you in a minute. Okay? Right? Students who came this morning, let's see if you still remember. Now, this pie chart is very, very important. Uh, um, do we have to translate anything? Oh, no. uh, I don't think so. You're okay, yeah? Oh, don't bad how Thai make huh? Oh yeah, okay, okay, that's fine. Sorry, it's just um I was in an event in another country and um, I asked them uh, I forgot to ask them whether or not they need a translation and then towards the end of the talk they came up to me and they said we didn't understand anything. <laughs> I was like, okay, <laughs> you, know, you should have told me in advance. But after four hours of speaking, they said, no, I don't, we didn't get anything because we didn't understand what you're saying. Um, okay, so um, this, this is very important. This pie chart is really, really crucial. The first thing the university will look at when they receive your application will be your GCSE or IGCSE or equivalent to GCSE or IGCSE. That's the first thing they will look at. Now, what is the rule of thumb? Those of you who are here this morning, what is the rule of thumb? What, is, what are the grades they're looking at? I want to see whether you remember. 6A stars, yes. 6A stars is the rule of thumb. Now, it doesn't mean if you don't get 6A stars, they won't look at you, because I've had students who've had 4A stars, 3A stars, 2A stars. I had a boy from Malaysia who had 4A stars in his GCSE, and he got into Cambridge for engineering. Okay, so it doesn't, it doesn't, but the rule of thumb, general rule of thumb is 6A stars. Those of you who are in year 11, as I said this morning, you have no excuse, you should be working towards 6A stars. Those of you who already done your GCSE, regardless of what you had, it's fine, you can work a strategy. Right, the next thing they will look at is AS results, but I put a question mark. Those of you this morning, why is there a question mark? Yes, well done. Some schools do AS, some schools don't do AS. We do AS because it's always good to show data. Universities want to see data. So AS results is good. Obviously, if you're, AS, if you're not going to get an A, then there's no point doing the ASs. However, um, if you, if you, those students who don't do AS, there's slightly disadvantage because then they will put more emphasis on the other sections of the pie chart. So if you do AS and you can get the scores, and AS is actually much easier than A2. If you can't get an A in AS, there is no, there's very little chance you're going to build it up in A2 because A2 is twice the amount of work, twice the amount of breadth, whether you're doing A level or IB. A2 year, the final year is always difficult. So, um, so you should really work in your AS year. So AS results question mark. Predicted grades um, is another thing the university will look at. Uh, predicted grades, however, is inflated. Most schools normally give very good predictions. I have seen schools where they give straight A stars prediction to almost every student. Um, and that is what's happening, this grade inflation. And because of the grade inflation, universities don't trust predicted grades as much. What, what I mean by that is, obviously they look at the predicted grades, but they will also need to rely on some other data as well. They cannot just rely on predictions, because if they just rely on predictions, is not good enough. I mean, it's not enough credible data for them. Uh, personal statement is another thing, but again, personal statement, you can get help from someone to write your personal statement, and hence why personal statement is not the only source of information they will rely on. So therefore, the two things which are in their control are the ones in orange. The two things which are in their control is admissions test and interview. These are the two things which they design they test you, they mark you, they know exactly what they're doing with these two components. The rest of the components are not in their control. So they love these two things. So I'm going to show you the timeline now so you understand why those two things are important. And I'm also going to prove to you why A-level results are not as important is the, or I would say the last stage of your application other than the first stage of your application. Your first stage to get the offer is based on these two plus this. Then comes your A-level results. But um, can I have those of you who are here this morning, what's the timeline? So shout out. So let's say we start September 2017. What happens next? Do you remember? Don't look at your sheets. Those of you who are here this morning, this is a test. 
Your homework was <laughs> After September, what happens? Yes. May what exam? Okay, 28. Come on. Next, come on, come on. Sorry? August. What happens in August? AS results. AS results. Okay, then. What happens next? Those of you who are here this morning. Come on, have you forgotten? This is the interesting bit. What happens next? September. September, thank you. What happens in September? A2. A2, you start your A2, your second year. Then what happens? What comes after September? October. What happens in October? What happens in October, people? You apply to university. And when you apply, what are the things they look at? What is the first thing they will see when you apply? What's the first thing they will see? GCSE or IGCSE or equivalent. So you could have um, um, high matriculation, you could have any qualification. What's the next thing they look at? AS results, but question mark because not everybody will have AS results, so it's not really comparable, but it's good to have if you're, if you're going to be able to demonstrate to them. What's next? Personal statement, well done. What's next? Interview, no, not interview. What's next? Something begins with R, or P actually, P. Predicted grades, thank you. And one more, begins with R. R. Given by your teacher, written by your teachers. Reference, yeah. Okay, so when you apply to university, this is the first thing they will look at, okay? Um, so, now I'm going to put an asterisk. This is a question mark because it's not comparable. GCSE, IGCSE equivalent, students have their own qualification. Personal statement is asterisk because anyone can get help for personal statement. Predicted grade and reference is they have grade inflation. So it's not really completely trustworthy. Okay. What happens after October? So we reach November. What happens in November? Remember? No? Come on. This was the most important bit. You're just shy. You don't want to say. What happens in November? Admission test. Admission test. Thank you. So this is when you will sit admissions test. What happens after November? Obviously December comes. What happens in December? Interview, thank you. And in interview, you have two types of interview. You have generic questions and you have specific. Specific one is more difficult, obviously. Um, okay. So, and also admissions test can also be before that as well. Admissions test doesn't have to be in November, it could be before that. Right, what happens after December? Which month do we go to now? Which month do we go to now? What happens after December? You can't have forgotten this, we just done it a few hours ago. <laughs> May. May, thank you, May. What happens in May? Uh, decisions. decisions. Decisions will be made by May from all the university. You either get an offer or you get a rejection. If you get the offer, the offer will be conditional upon A-level results. What happens after May? June, what happens in June? A-level exam. 
exams or IB exams, well, IB is slightly earlier. It has exams August. You will get your results. October. Hopefully you will start university of your choice. Happy days. Do you remember the timeline, those of you who were here this morning? Yes? Okay, just for the for those of you who haven't seen this, this might be a little bit overwhelming, but this is the cycle. This is the cycle of the application. Now, this may be the cycle where you need to know what is the formula. So if you just follow me because um, you'll have to look at the board for this, otherwise you'll miss the point. So if I can just have your attention just for two seconds, it'll be very quick. Um, otherwise you'll miss the point otherwise. So yeah, okay, so I'm just going to show you now, right? So if you follow me on the board, okay, so the formula to get the offer is this. This is number one for admission test, number two for interview, number three, this is number three, okay? Getting the A-level result is number four. So the formula is one plus two plus three in the order of importance. One being the most important, two, second, third will give you offer. Offer plus four, which is four there, will give you your university. That is the formula. And that is to get into these top universities. Did you get that? Would you like me to repeat it? Can I you want me to repeat it? Okay. So one is admissions test. Number two is interview. Number three is this whole section. Okay. Number four is your A-level results. So one plus two plus three gets you the offer. Once you get the offer, then you have to meet your conditions. Number four. That's how you get into university of your choice. Okay, and the conditional upon A level results, the results they're looking for is A star AA or A star A star A. So, your academic actually comes secondary. Your career preparation comes primary. So, these two things makes it vital to get into a top university. This, however, comes, A-level result comes secondary. Does that make sense by secondary? What I mean is, if you don't get the offer in the first place, your four A stars doesn't mean anything, unless you reapply again the following year. So, in order to get the offer to start the university at a time, you have to fulfill these three criteria first. Get the offer, then you meet the offer, you get to university of your choice. I hope that makes sense. Yes? Any questions before I move on? Yes? Let's say you took a gap year after the education level. Uh huh. And your the result comes, comes up. So when you apply, how, how would you get the question? Right. So when you apply, this two will still be important. This becomes less important. So number three becomes less important because you've already got your A level results. So they won't look at your GCSEs because you've already got the A level results. But you still have to get one and two. If you don't meet your admissions test and you don't do well in your interview, you may still not get an offer, even with four A stars. How are we doing? Are we okay? It's a bit of a revolutionary thinking because we go to school and we say you have to get the grades. But now I'm saying the grades is secondary. <laughs> it's not going to get you the offer. The grades comes last, right? So hopefully that gives you an idea of what universities are looking for. Any questions before I move on? No, nothing from the parents? No, your kids who are here this morning, they've, they've been grilled into this, so hopefully they, they get the idea. Um, but if they haven't, then I suggest they look through their notes again because this is really important. Okay, now, um, why admission tests are becoming increasingly important? As I said earlier on, top GCSE grades do not guarantee top A-level results. Standalone AS results is not enough for the admission tutor to make a decision. Predicted grades and teacher references may be inaccurate. Personal statement may not be completely the student's work. 
And that is why admissions tests and interview is becoming extra important. Now, there are some students who get rejected even before interview stage. If they get rejected before interview stage, it's because this section and this section hasn't been completed to a good standard. The, the key point is you need to get to an interview stage. Because if you get to an interview stage, you have a chance of getting an offer. If you get stuck here, that means there is, you can't move on. That means you have to apply the following year. And then you still have to do well in these two sections. And by the way, everything I'm talking about, I'm just talking about top universities. If you're aiming to get into any university in the UK or US or anywhere in the world, most universities are desperate for international students because education has become so commercialized. So most universities are desperate to have you on board. As long as you get your grades, you should get an offer. Okay? You don't have to do all of this. You don't have to do all this. The key point is, can you get into those top universities? I challenge my students to aim, to, to challenge themselves to aim as high as possible because if you aim for 100%, you can drop to 90%. If you aim for 90%, you drop to 80%. If you start aiming for 70%, you will definitely drop to 60 or 50. So it's very important that they aim. So all my students, regardless of their academic background, they all work towards Oxbridge, even when, when they may think that they don't have a chance to get to Oxbridge because if they work towards the number one university in the world, Right? If they don't get there, it's okay. They'll get into Imperial, Warwick, UCL, KCL, equally very good university. But the journey, the process of going through this whole thing makes them more stronger, makes them better, makes them more uh, resilient in what they do. And that is key because that money can't buy. Right? That is key because that strength is very, very important. Um, I told the students this morning there are three types of students. One is a good student. A good student is probably all your children. They come to school, they come on time, they go to class, they do their homework, you know, they do exactly what they're told. That's a good student. An excellent student is somebody who goes the extra mile. So if I give them 10 questions, they will do 20 questions. If I finish my lecture, they'll come and ask me more questions. That's an excellent student. They go extra mile. The third type of student is a chaser, is a wow student. I give you an example of what I mean by that. I had one student who is very, very quiet. He will not say boo to anybody. And he went for, a, um, um, he went to, um, uh, for an interview at Imperial. At the end of the interview, the admission tutor said to him, I'm so impressed by you, I would like you to choose my university. You don't have to sell yourself to me. I would like you to choose my university. What's happened there is the university is chasing him. And that is the difference. That is that wow factor. That is very hard to get. I had another student just recently, and he's got an offer from Imperial, and he's just waiting from Cambridge now. Um, he went for his interview. After the interview, he received a postcard from the admission tutor, from his interviewer. The interviewer wrote in the postcard, it was great meeting you, I, uh, or something like, I hope you enjoyed our meeting. Not interview, he called it meeting. I hope you enjoyed our meeting. If you have any questions about admissions, please speak to our admissions department. It's a postcard. Now, normally, admission tutors or interviewers do not find the time to get a postcard, send it to students, you know, find the address. But, you know, nobody does that. Nobody has time these days, yeah? Right? The fact that he took the time to say, I really enjoyed our meeting. Meeting, not even interview. And it was an interview, you know? Now that boy got offered straight away from his university. The point I'm making is this, that the university chases you because you have given them that wow factor. And what I like to do is I like to get my students to at least have the courage, have the courage to fail, right? Because a lot of people have fear of failure. I want them to have the courage to fail. What I mean by that is when you go into a boxing ring for a match, you go in with the mentality to win. You also know there's a risk of losing, right? You go into any athlete, any competition, you go into the ring, you know there's a risk of losing. But you still go in there with the mentality to win, regardless of whether you win or lose. But you go in there with that courage that, yes, I might fail, but I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to give it a try because I have trained my body so hard that I'm going to give it a try. 
the same thing in education. If we train ourselves, if we give ourselves that time and aspiration and really push ourselves, you could make it there. I had a boy who came from Albania whose education system is very weak. After the end of first month, he said to me, this is very, very tough. I can't do maths. I cannot compete amongst the students from China. They are doing 10 questions in 10 minutes. I'm doing one question in one hour. You know, I'm, I'm going to give up. So I said to him, look, it's up to you. You can either choose to, to give up or you can have the courage to fail here, right? What do you want? And he said, he looked at me, he said, what do you mean courage or fail? I said, it's up to you. You can either persevere and you may still fail, right? You may, there's no guarantee. Or you can just persevere. Now that boy ended up getting the best results in the college. He went to Cambridge University for engineering. Not only that, he was offered full scholarship by Cambridge University. Only 11 students are given full scholarship around the world. 11 students were given full scholarship by Cambridge. Two out of that 11 in that one year were my students. One from Vietnam and one from Albania. When I met the father, he said to me, thank you so much. And he didn't say thank you because he got into Cambridge. Thank you because I don't have to pay anything. So I've saved my money, <laughs> you know. So the fact is, the point I'm trying to make is, his beginnings, when he first started, he was really, he was like, I can't do this. The Chinese students are 10 times ahead of me in maths. And I want to do engineering. I can't do it. So either you have the fear of failure, fear of failure, or you have the courage to fail. And that is the difference. And that is what I, so all my students in my college, regardless of their academic background, they go through this process, regardless of the outcomes in the end. Because I want them to go through that journey. It is a tough journey. It is not easy. But it makes you so much stronger. When you go to university, you become more and more inspired to do even greater things. You know, when my students take part in competitions and so on, um, they come back afterwards and they say, I didn't know I could do it. It's just like when you were four years old or when you were started, you remember when you started learning to bike, but you learned to ride your bike, you fell, right? How many times do you fell and you get up, you keep learning to ride? It's exactly the same concept here. And that is what we're trying to do. Okay, so um, the admission test is testing numerical and verbal reasoning skills speed and accuracy, ability to organize and express ideas, ability to understand arguments and how they work or fail. Can I ask, before I move on, um, amongst the students who are here, who were not here this morning, can you put your hands up? Any students who were not here this morning? Okay, right. Can I just ask what year you're in? Year 12. Year 12? Year 12? There was another, yes. Year 10. Anyone else who was not here this morning? Year 11. Okay. Now, um, there are some examples of admissions test questions. Uh, those of you who were here this morning, don't tell the answers. Okay? Keep quiet because you know the answers. I'm going to give you a taste of what the questions are like. Parents, don't worry. I'm not going to ask you to answer the questions. You can chill. Okay? You can relax. Right? Okay? Now, just to give you an idea of admissions test, this list is not exhaustive. So for medicine, there are two admissions tests, economics, mathematics, engineering, computer science, law. What, what is it that you like to do as a career? Biotechnology. Biotechnology, okay. Engineering. engineering, so you have two tests up there. Biotechnology, depending on whether you're looking at natural sciences, if you're looking at natural sciences, then the test is called NSAA. Okay, if you're looking at biomed, it's BMAT. Young man, you know what you want to do? Computer science, so that's a CSAT test. Uh, CSAT, if you're doing computer science with maths, is CSAT plus 10. Okay? Um, young man there, year 10, it's very early. I'm really glad you are thinking ahead, that's fantastic. Do you have an idea? If you don't, it's fine. No, I, I thought so. Anyone else I missed out? Yes. Medicine. So you've got UK CAT and BMAT as your test. Now, these admission tests are becoming more and more important because guess what, like I said, they mark your test, they, des they design the papers, the questions are from the admission tutors, they design it, they mark it and sort of thing. We at our college, we do six to eight hours a week of training by mentors from the university uh, because we have access to Oxford University mentors. So they come in every week to prepare the students for admissions test training. This is a very tough thing. You cannot just leave it to the last minute. It's not going to help you. You've got to make sure you tackle this. As I said, number one, in terms of order of importance, one, two, and three. One being admissions test, two being interview, three being this bit. 
And you might think interview is easy because all you have to do is be a good debater. If, no, if you don't have substance, as I told you earlier on, the boy who went for his interview, he is very quiet. He never, he's never done any performance in his life. I mean, he's very, very quiet young man, but yet he had substance. Substance, knowledge, application of the knowledge. I said this to this, this morning to the kids. Um, when you go to school and when you study maths, chemistry, biology, physics, and whatever subjects you do, who teaches you maths? Who teaches you maths? No, don't tell me the name of the teacher, but who teaches you maths? Is it, a, is it a chemistry teacher who teaches you maths, history teacher? Or is it someone who knows maths who teaches you maths? Someone who knows maths, right? So you have a maths teacher teaching you maths. Agree? So the same thing here. You need a specialist to teach you that. It's no different. Do not treat this less equal than your academic results. The same thing with your interview skills. Who does your inter... You know, again, you will not have a history teacher teaching you chemistry. You will not accept it as parents, right? So why do you accept having not a uh, person who specializes in that field to train your child in the interview as well? It's equally the same message. You've got to be trained by the people who know exactly what they're doing. That's very, very important. Right, um, so I'm gonna give you some examples. And um, so those of you who are here this morning, please don't share the answers. For the parents, like I said, you please, you don't have to get involved, but um, it'll be good for you to get an understanding of what type of questions they would ask you. And by the way, I picked questions, random questions from a selection of all the papers. I haven't chosen one specific paper, I've just chosen random um, questions. Um, so just so that, and this list is not exhaustive. There are many careers which is not on this list. So if you had a career like architecture, it's not on this list here, but there is an admissions test, there is a portfolio. Um, if there's a psychology, psychology is TSA. So I haven't listed every single career, but almost all careers at top universities require admissions tests. Even if you want to do uh, ancient civilization, you have an admissions test. If you want to do classical Greek, there's an admissions test. If you want to do linguistic, there's an admissions test. Every career at top university, every course at top university has an admissions test. So just to give you an idea. Okay, just to give you some sample questions, and we're gonna be very quick, we're not gonna spend much time on this, just so that you get an idea. Question one, um, so calves farm for veal are reared in extremely cruel conditions and have a short and miserable life. Other meats are available, such as lamb and meat eaters who are concerned about cruelty to animals should avoid veal and consume one of these alternatives. Which one of the following is an underlying assumption of the above argument? Some parents are looking horrified. <laughs> right, like I said, you don't have to give the answers, but for the students in the room, if you want to, um, you want to give a go. Normally one minute per question. Okay, can we have the answer? How many of you think A? B? I tell you what, you know what, I won't ask you, I'll just give you the answer so you can check it because you're amongst your parents. So you may not want to give the answers. <laughs> okay, right. And the answer is C. If you got C, then you're right. Okay, next one. There are any number of theories to explain these events, and since even the experts disagree, it is blank the rest of us in our role as responsible scholars to blank dogmatic, dogmatic statements. Each of the following pairs of words can be inserted into the blank, but which pair makes the best sense? Okay. C. Next question. 
This is interesting. Albert says everything Caroline says is true. Betty says everything I say is false. Caroline says everything David says is true. David says everything Caroline says is false. Who is the only one who could be telling the truth? This is just to give you an awareness. So don't worry about the fact that if you can't do the questions, it's not a problem. You're right? It's just like imagine you are the first time you're playing cricket. You have 10 months to prepare. <laughs> before you go over there. So don't worry, you know, this is not something you need to be worried about if you don't know the answers at this stage. It's all about practice and training and good learning, right? That's, that's, that's what you need. Okay, I'm going to give the answer now. D. If David is right, then everything Caroline says is false. Did you get it right, young man? You look excited when you got it. How old are you? Year nine. Well done, excellent, brilliant. Okay, fantastic. Right, next question. Above is Thomas Leslie Fuller's brass paperweight, which shows his initial. Which one of the above is not an above view of the paperweight when it is placed flat on a table either side up? So engineers and architects, they should be able to answer this question. you got an answer. No? <laughs> okay, the answer is B. Okay, next one. In order to succeed in academic examination, it is necessary to study. Therefore, if a student works hard in a particular subject, he or she should do well when it comes to the examination. Which of the following best describes the flaw in the argument? This requires a little bit more verbal reasoning. Okay, I think you get the gist. The answer is D. A solid cube has 12 edges. If all eight corners are sliced a bit away while leaving part of each original edge intact, how many edges has the new solid? This should be something that uh, my, most people will find interested in doing. Uh, by the way, not to burst your bubble, but these are warm-up questions. <laughs> it gets harder from here. <laughs> this is just, you know, imagine you're playing on a game, this is just level one. <laughs> okay, you've got to beat level one to get to the next stages. Yeah. But don't worry, if you're finding it difficult and you think you can't get to level one, you can get onto level one. So it's just, a, it's just an awareness. Today is just an awareness, okay? Right, so the answer here is D. So hopefully you got D, right? Next one, last question. The diagram shows a small village church. There's a door in the western end which can be clearly seen in the diagram. There's a tower at the eastern end of the church with the window set in its east wall. This wall is hidden in the diagram. There's also a door in the tower. Which of these is most likely to be the view of the eastern end of the church? measure speed and accuracy so it's not just accuracy but also speed so you literally have less than a minute to answer each question
But obviously, this doesn't mean this may not apply to the course that you are applying for because I've taken a selection, a random selection. Okay, so the answer here is A. Okay, now that was multiple choice questions. Okay, then you also have essays as well. And guess what? The essays are written, uh, basically, whatever you write in your essays, it will go to the admission tutor. And when you come for your interview, if you do get to the interview stage, then they will have your essay in front of you. And the first thing they will ask you is, are you happy with what you've written? <laughs> Would you like to change it? <laughs> you know. So again, that is another topic of, 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 of another thing to, uh, to, to when you go for your interview. So the essay questions are as important as your multiple choice questions. Anyway, do you now, uh, for the parents in the room, do you now understand why this admissions test has become important? Because you see, think about it. Think, if you are the admission tutor, imagine you are the admission tutor, right? You are at a stage where GCSE, not everybody in the world is GCSE, agree? Yes? Not everyone has AS, agree? Not everyone can show the schools are giving a great inflation. Everybody's getting very good results. Everybody's having great references. What are the admission tutors supposed to do? What are they supposed to do? Previously, they had AS results. At least from the AS results, they can at least filter students based on AS results. Now they don't have AS results. They cannot rely completely on predictions. I know some people do IV, but they cannot rely on that set of data alone because predictions are being inflated. Reference is being inflated. So imagine you are the admission tutor. You need more data. You need more data. And the data comes from something which is in their control. The data comes from admission test and from interview. And in the interview, they can ask you really technical questions, very specific questions to your course, to your career. Because they want to know whether you have the passion, whether you have the understanding about your course and career. So just for the parents in the room, I hope you get why admission tutors are using that. This is a very logical explanation. Yeah? Any questions? No? Either I'm really bad or I'm really good because <laughs> you're not asking any questions. <laughs> it's one of the extreme. I can't tell which one, so I'm going to leave it to you guys to decide. Okay, so no questions. I'll move on. Okay, um, this is actually for the students this morning about how to write essay questions. We won't talk about personal statement because that is something the... Um, uh, but actually, I, I will show you the video. Can we put the video on? Right, we'll show you. It's scary. You're sitting there, there's a blank sheet of paper. It's in front of you. You've got to fill it up. You've got to talk about yourself. You've got to talk about your interest in the course. But what do you put? This is your future. It's scary. Well, nobody knows you better than you know yourself. You have the opportunity now to show why you're so much better than everybody else applying for your course. So you've got to start thinking about what makes you stand out, but stand out in a good way. I'm Jane Marshall. I work for a university. I spend my life reading personal statements. I read lots of them and I mean lots. That means I know what makes a good personal statement and what makes a bad personal statement. You have to remember everybody's unique. There are lots of different ways of going about it. So this should get you well on the way to writing an excellent personal statement. So where do you start? Well, the first thing you need to do is start getting words down on that blank sheet of paper. Loads of them. Whatever you can think of. Why are you so excited about the course you're applying for? What is it that gets you really excited about that particular course? What floats your boat? Be excited. Be positive. Don't be negative. Don't say something like, I've always wanted to be a dentist because it's so much easier than being a doctor. Because that isn't positive. Focus on the positives. Tell us how you got excited about this particular course. Uh, did you read an article about something? Did it get you inspired? Did you then go and see a lecture from somebody that made you think, wow, I'm so excited, I'm going to write a project on that? That's the sort of thing we're looking for. And you can get all of this evidence from work experience, outside reading, all the sorts of things you do that back up your interest in the course. So throw those examples at the page. Get excited. Once you've got the stuff down about the course, then you've got to start thinking about the skills you've got that would help you cope with that particular course. Transferable skills, stuff like communication, essay writing, leadership, that sort of thing. And you've got to start throwing more words at the page until something sticks. If you're getting stuck, ask your friends and family. They might be able to come up with some ideas. Occasionally they don't. Avoid saying things like, I know I can be an excellent teacher because my friends tell me I'm really good at telling people what to do all the time. Because think about what that's saying about you.
Then think about what's exciting about you. What makes you unique? Think of what you do that's interesting. What makes you stand out? And remember, you may not think it's interesting, but somebody else will. You might like gaming. You might like gardening. You might like train spotting. So will somebody else. So get something like that down on paper as well. So what do you do next? You've got this big sheet of paper with all of these words on it and you've got to get it into something resembling a personal statement. That means you've got to squash it. You've got to condense it. So you need to start off with a really punchy opening paragraph. This is the bit where you tell us how incredibly excited you are about the course you're applying for and that you really understand what it is you're getting yourself into. Then you move on to the middle paragraph. That's the chunky bit. That's full of all the evidence you're going to need to prove your interest in the particular course. You're also going to sprinkle in some of the bits about your skills and good qualities so we know you can actually do it. But that's your middle paragraph. And then you move on to the end bit and that's the bit about the personal touch. This is the bit where you tell us you are unique. You tell us about the things you're interested in that will help you fit into university life as a whole. So, what do you avoid? Well, the first thing is verbal diarrhoea. You've got to keep focused. You haven't got enough space to go off piste, so make sure you're being relevant about the course you're applying for. That's really important. Other things to avoid. Showing off. Don't be arrogant. It's absolutely fine to back yourself up using lots of relevant examples. That's called good showing off. But don't be bad showing off. That is arrogance. Avoid flowery language. Keep it to plain English. We need to understand what you're actually trying to say, so avoid the honour and the privilege of a particular work experience. Just focus on plain English. Avoid clichés. I don't want to see anybody saying, I've wanted to be a doctor ever since I was born. Because you haven't. That's rubbish. Keep it to actual, normal, plain English. Copying. Don't copy. They have some software called Copycatch. It will catch you if you copy somebody else's work. So they're the things you need to avoid. So, just to recap, This personal statement, you've got to show us that you know what you've applied for. You've got to show us how excited you are. You've got to give us examples. Make sure it's a combination, though, of head and heart. Be authentic. Be focused. But be enthusiastic. That's what we're looking for. You're not going to get it right on the first go, but keep coming back to it. You'll get it right in the end. And eventually, you'll have a fantastic personal statement that tells us all about you. But um, can we just hold on? Can we go to the next slide? Um, and actually, I am going to I'm going to skip all that. Just skip through that until the information for parents. Because this bit is what I did with the students this morning. But you don't need to know the details of all that. Um, but what you do need to know is this. Right. So we just hold on. One second. Right. Okay. So if I just can get your attention here. Everything that we have spoken about, right? Um, I'm going to tell you how I, my success is because of this curriculum. I have an integrated curriculum that I have designed, right? And that basically means a combination of those all three elements. So this is just to share with you how my students get into top universities or how and why the, the, the numbers that got into these top universities, why are they at those numbers? It's because we have combined it into the curriculum. So it starts off with academic. In academic, you have to, obviously your A-level subjects, first of all, you have to make sure you choose the right subjects and B, you get the right grades, obviously. If you don't do the right subjects, so for example, in medicine, if you do maths and further maths, it's covered as one subject. But for engineering and economics, it's two subjects. You have to do the right subjects to begin with. Those of you in year 10, in year 11, when you go to A2 year, make sure you do the right subjects. There are many students get rejected from the university, from the onset, because they haven't done the right subjects. Subjects, Tom Comcher, is very, very important. Then you want to make sure you get the grades. But remember, the grades is at what number? The grades is at number four of the formula. It's not number one, it's not number two, it's not number three. Great. EPQ, External Project Qualification, is a research project that you do based on what you have an interest in. EPQ is also part of like A-levels. So A-level and EPQ, you can combine those two things together. So that is part of the, remember the formula? One plus two plus three gets you the offer, plus four, gets you to the university. So that bit is number four. Now obviously like any other college, 
we teach the students, we do six to seven hours a week on every subject, so that's like any other college. Now, admission test is number one. Admission test was number one part of that formula, so we do six hours a week of training for admissions test, and like I said to you before, you won't expect a history teacher to teach you maths. We get specialists who are, if they're doctors they're from Oxford University, they come and train our students for medicine. If they're engineers, they again train the engineering student. Lawyers train the law, prospective law students. It's very, very specific because I, I, I need it to be the same. I need to give it the same um, amount of effort as I do for my academic subjects. So if I'm going to recruit a maths teacher to teach maths, I need to make sure I recruit a medical expert from Oxford University, say, who can come and train the students in medicine. We are very lucky that we have access to Oxford University mentors, but this is what you need to be doing. You need to be training yourself with the admission test. If you haven't got that access, then you need to make sure you do a lot of reading. Do lots and lots of practice, and you do lots and lots of reading if you haven't got that access, okay? The next bit is this. Now, before I move on to these two things, um, can I ask the students who just uh, came this evening? When you sit for your maths test, right, or chemistry test, what do you do before you sit for your chemistry test? So imagine you have your chemistry exam, right? What do you do before you sit the chemistry exam? Before the past paper, you go to classes, right? You go to classes, you learn chemistry, you gain knowledge, agreed? What do you do with the knowledge? You then do past papers to apply the knowledge, agreed? The same thing you need to do for your personal statement and for your interview. It is no different from a normal lesson. So if you are learning chemistry and you have a chemistry exam after two years, you need to build the knowledge in chemistry, then you need to gain application by doing past paper, then you go into the exam hall, right? You will not go into an exam hall by just doing some past papers the day before the exam. You will be doing a thorough revision. Yeah, agree? You'll be all doing thorough revision, agree? Yeah? Now, unless you're a genius and you can do go into the exam without any revision. But you will go through by like, knowledge and application. The same for your personal statement and the same for your interview. You have to have knowledge and you have to have application of that knowledge. So in our college, we have something called bridging program that is two hours a week. Again, the bridging program are taught by mentors, specialists in their field. So medics will be taught by a doctor, engineers will be taught by an engineer, lawyers will be taught by a lawyer, and etc. etc. The bridging program gives the knowledge. So if you don't have access to that, you've got to make sure you gain knowledge. Either you gain knowledge by reading or whatsoever. This morning, I asked the students, this is for the parents, and this is quite worrying, because I asked the students to make a list of all the activities they have done. And for every activity they have done, give me one skill. Give me one skill for every activity, and they must not repeat the skill. Most of them were only able to give me four or five skills. That is, that is worrying, which means that whatever they have done, they haven't understood the purpose of it or the skills they've gained. So when they go for the interview, they will not be that wow student. They may not even be an excellent student because if you can't tell them the skills you have gained from every activity you have done, and it must not be repetitive, then that means you haven't got enough passion, right? So that, that it becomes a problem. Um, so it's very important. So application of the knowledge is very important. Work experience, wider reading, competitions, voluntary work courses. We do this throughout the year. We do four weeks of internship uh, placements in the UK and we do work experience abroad as well. This is very important. Application of the knowledge. It is just like you're preparing for your chemistry exam. You will go into a chemistry exam by, by learning throughout the year and then doing lots of past papers. Agree? Exactly the same concept. So don't worry about writing your personal statement and don't worry about going for your interview. That is the execution, that is your exam. Go through the journey first. Get your journey sorted out first. And then, trust me when I tell you, you'll have a great personal statement and you'll have a great interview. But you've got to go through the journey. It's very, very crucial. I make my students go through this. It's tough, it's hard. You know, life is difficult, but drip, drip, drip every day. They're doing, you know, they're absorbing. The brain is like a sponge. 
You got to absorb slowly and surely, slowly but surely. And then it all triggers. When you go to that interview hall, everything floods back. It's just like your exam. When you go to chemistry exam, everything floods back because you've done a whole year of preparation. Exactly the same. Do not leave it to the last minute. That's the worst thing you can do. Okay, so the formula, just going back to the formula. Remember, one plus two plus three. One admissions test, two is interview, three is that whole section of the UCAS application. So this bit here will come under two plus three. Okay, so three means personal statement, two is interview. So that is part of the formula. I'm just explaining to you what an integrated curriculum means. Okay, last bit, personal development. We have two sections, extracurricular and supercurricular. Um, extracurricular is music, sports and arts, and this is for the parents in the room. Right, every student who applies to university all have, have done at least something from music, sports or arts, or maybe all three, okay? Now, I get, when I sit on the interview panel, every time I receive applications from girls, Asian girls from Southeast Asia, all the girls have graded piano. And they have this long list of things they've done, arts and music and graded piano this and graded ballet this and all sorts of things. Fantastic, it's great that you have all these skills and it's brilliant, they love to see all that. It shows that you are a all-rounder. However, does that mean you're gonna be a great lawyer? Does that mean you're gonna be a great engineer? Does that mean that you are telling me you have passion in engineering or medicine? Of course not. What it tells me is that your parents have been great taxi drivers. <laughs> That's what it tells me. It tells me that you're focused, you're determined. You can, you know, you have something that you're routine. Fantastic. You've been doing this from young age. Brilliant. We love it. <clears throat> Carry on. But it's not enough, unfortunately. And extracurricular activities only makes up 20% of your application or 25% of your application. Extracurricular activity is only there to de-stress yourself, unwind yourself. It's not really there to um, to get you into these, um, you know, into these top universities. Now, have you ever heard of supercurricular activities? Supercurricular activities are enrichment classes that helps you to gain more knowledge to get into the university of your choice. I give you an example. My kids at the college. Regardless of what course they want to do, they all do philosophy classes. Why? Because philosophy teaches them to think from a different perspective. Philosophy is the root of all subjects. Whether they want to do math, whether they want to do engineering, it doesn't matter. My kids do coding, they do debating, they do critical thinking, analytical skills, data analytics. They do um, um, lots of different young enterprise. They do uh, in Edinburgh. Some of these things you probably already have in your school. but all these things, if you add up, it becomes super curricular. That means it's honing into your career because you never know the one thing, the one element that will make a difference in your application. So the more you do, you build up. Um, one parent from Malaysia has told me recently that ever since her son is doing philosophy classes, he's now thinking from a different perspective on every issue. And that is, the, that is how you become a wow student. That is how you become from an excellent student to a wild student. So that's very important for you to understand super curricula. So we do two to three hours weekly on every, um, we have a list of 18 enrichment activities so students can choose um, and they can do as many as they want or as little as they want. But this is two plus three. So just going back to the formula, one plus two plus three, Gives you offer, plus four, gets you to university. So the curriculum fits in with the formula. So hopefully that gives you an idea. And um, before I show you this interview practice, I'm going to tell you a story. Uh, the students this morning know this story. There was a boy who came for his interview for medicine and the first question that was asked to him, on paper, this was a brilliant student. He was a fantastic student. A star, straight A stars, prediction brilliant. And in the reference, the teacher said, um, the president of his country invited him for dinner. So we as interviewers were so excited to meet him. We were like, wow, the best student from the country. 
It's a very small country as well. The best student for your country. I'm so excited to meet you. Anyway, he comes, sits down. The first question asked was, why medicine? And the answer was, I would like to be a doctor because my father's a doctor, my mother's a doctor, my um, uh, grandfather was into herbal medicine or something like that, my aunt is a biochemist, my another uncle is a pharmacist, and I know everything about medicine. Um, so we then said to him, okay, we understand that you come from a pedigree of medical background, fantastic, but tell us why you want to be a doctor. And then he took, a, you know, he took a deep sigh and he thought about it and then he said, I like to be a doctor because my father's a doctor, my mother's a doctor, my aunt is a biochemist, my uncle is a pharmacist, my grandfather, and I really know everything about medicine. Okay, anyway, so by this time we were looking at each other and we were like, oh my God, what do we do now? So we thought, okay, we'll give him another help. You know, I mean, come on, the president invited him for dinner. He must be somebody, right? So we thought, okay, we will, we will, we'll give him another chance. So my colleague then said to him, I have three kids and they hate the fact that I'm a doctor because I have no time. I'm constantly working all the time. So why do you want to be a doctor? Right? We keep trying to help him. We're even giving him the answer to tell us, right? We're trying everything. This time he took a deep sigh, deep breath, and then he says, I like to be a doctor because my father's a doctor, my mother's a doctor, my grandfather is a doctor or uh, into herbal medicine, my aunt is a pharmacist, and I know everything about medicine and I really want to be a doctor. Anyway, his interview lasted only 10 minutes and he was rejected. Even though on paper he was an excellent, excellent, excellent student in everything. He met all the criteria. He met section one, he met section one, he met section two, where did he fail? He met section one and three, but he failed in section two. Another story, a girl from Singapore, very, very good school in Singapore, I will not mention the name, but it's one of the best schools in Singapore. Two girls came from that school, right, on the same day for the interview. Um, one girl, was uh, the kids who were here this morning. I didn't tell this story, so you better listen. Right, um, so two girls came, and one girl interview was very good. The other girl, the interview, the question was posed to her, and they said to her, okay, so all the, the interview was going very well, very, very well. The whole interview was going very well. That there was one question, right? And the question was, okay, so imagine you have, um, um, you have patients outside your clinic, you have like, 20, 30 patients waiting for you, okay? And then you have a call from the hospital that you have to attend an emergency because you're a doctor, you have to go and attend the emergency in the hospital. What do you do? What do you tell the patient outside who's waiting for you? Any ideas here? What do you think you should tell the, the patients who are waiting outside? There's about 20, 30 people waiting for you and you get this call from the hospital. Any ideas? Any volunteers here? What would you do in that situation? I didn't tell the story this morning. So those of you who are who are here, yes. Apologies for the inconvenience. Apologies for the inconvenience, and then you ask them to go home. But you don't know because your emergency could be I don't know one hour. It could be ten hours. You don't know. So are you going to send them home or what do you do? Yes? Maybe tell them to come back. I don't know what time. Tell them to come back? But you don't know when you're going to be able to come back. Um. Any other guesses? <laughs> Anyone else? Yes? Find another doctor. Yes, okay. Right, now this girl from Singapore said, I will make them come back. Like you said, apologize for the inconvenience. As soon as she left the room, and this is no reflection on you guys, okay? This was uh, just an, or, or a starting point. As soon as she left the room, the interviewers look at each other and she, they said, she's a control freak. I don't want her in my university. Because the answer is, you give the you give your uh, patients to another doctor if you have to go for an emergency, right? That girl on one question, guess what? Just on one question, rejected. 
She was doing so well. Everything was going so well until that point. Right? So, these are the things that you have to be aware of. And this is why, guys, the only way to be able to answer these questions, the only way to be able to answer these questions is through experiences. So the more they do here, the more they do this part, the more wiser they become, the better their approach is in an interview. These things you cannot teach them. You can't just sit there and say, this is the question, this is the answer. This is the question, this is the answer. It's not a textbook. This is, this is an exam of life. You can't teach from textbook, right? You need to go through the experiences to get to a point that you can answer those questions. The experiences count more than your classroom time, right? Because, like for example, in some of the tests, like in medicine, there's a one section called situational judgment. The questions are, if you see 10 pounds on the floor, what do you do? You know, if you're, if you're, um, if you're in a uh, performance uh, and your friend, your friend is in a performance and the parents, uh, the parents met a car accident, what do you do? Do you tell your, do you tell your friend? Uh, before she's going for a performance or do you wait after the performance? They ask you these kind of questions because they want to see your situational judgment. It's all about wisdom and the only way to get this wisdom is through experiences. Is that journey that counts a lot more than just textbook exercise. I am a firm believer that academic excellence is just a byproduct of your passion. Academic excellence is a byproduct. If you are passionate enough to do something, you will get the grades. You shouldn't rush after the grades. The grades will come. If you are passionate, you will get the grades. Right? You've got to be. You've got to understand what you want to do first. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you the interview practice very quickly, and then we're almost finished. It's good to meet you. So first of all, um, can you tell me about yourself, please? Uh, well, my name's Harry, uh, 18 years old. Uh, currently doing my A-levels at the moment. I'm doing pretty well, actually. And um, yeah, I'd like to be a doctor when I'm older. Yeah. First impressions definitely count um, 100%. Um, interviewers can sometimes make their decision and mind upon the person that they're interviewing within the first few minutes. So even if you are nervous or not feeling so confident, make sure that you, your first impression does really count. Have a firm handshake, good eye contact and smile. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about yourself please? Uh, sure, my name's Harry, I'm 18 years old and I'm currently studying um, biology, chemistry and maths at, uh, at school. Mm -hmm. And uh, as you are aware, I uh, hope to pursue a career in medicine Anyone who's called for interview has obviously got to plan their journey, particularly if they're coming from the Channel Islands, to make certain that they're going to be in there in time. So if it's in the morning, that they fly over the night before. So they arrive on time, they have time to settle down, be prepared, they dress appropriately. Uh, that, particularly for some of the professional courses, which is the majority of our courses that interview, somebody only has to walk, walk in wearing completely the wrong clothing and they'll have made the worst impression. So why do you want to be a doctor and what would you like to achieve in medicine? Oh, well, uh, everyone in my family is a doctor, so uh, I think it just follows on nicely that I am too, really. Um, I think I'd be a great doctor, to be honest. I've got great people skills. Be confident, but try not to come across as if you're arrogant and a know-it-all. It is a fine balance because you have got to sell yourself, but you want to show that you're a team player and that you're going to fit in well and that you are teachable. Yeah, I'd also like to uh, be a director, have a nice big salary for myself. Then. Okay, thank you. Hmm. People that are interviewing you are, want to see that you're committed to the subject, that you've got a passion for the subject, and, and that's the reason why you're wanting to devote yourself to this period of extended study, they wouldn't want to place someone who's doing it purely for money. And uh, why do you want to be a doctor and what do you hope to achieve in medicine? Well, I've done a lot of work experience um, in, in many different areas. Um, for example, the local hospital radio. I've done some uh, volunteering on the wards there. Uh, and also at the Jersey Hospice and the Cheshire Homes. Um, and everything I did there, um, I, I saw 
patients uh, in, in their environment and the doctors working alongside them um, in the multidisciplinary team that they have. Um, and it was absolutely fascinating and everything I did there just really made me want to continue uh, my research and, uh, and be successful in getting a place at medical school. When we see a CV, um, if somebody has work experience, even if it's volunteering or it's, it's free, um, then it certainly goes a long way for us to look at the CV a little bit harder. We're really looking for a student who has undertaken work experience, not just so they're just ticking a box to show us they've done it, but they can really demonstrate to us what they've learnt, what they've gained, how they've reflected on their experiences, and it's given them an insight into that profession. So apart from treating patients, Harry, what do you think uh, being a doctor is going to entail? Well, uh, it's a lot of paperwork, obviously. Not really looking forward to that at all, to be honest. I think it's a bit of a faff. But, um, yeah, there is a bedside manner part as well, um, I suppose, yeah, you've got to be able to talk. Worst thing that we've seen at interview is negative language. The right attitude is key. Um, we're looking for somebody who's enthusiastic, who's positive, who's willing to learn, who's got the, you know, who can prove they've got the good organisational skills, the good communication skills. Well, um, obviously the treatment is a very important part, uh, but alongside that you also need to be um, very academic, um, and very studious to keep up to date with the um, constantly changing and evolving um, field that you are in. Um, you also have to be um, an excellent communicator um, with your team and also with the patients. If a student's very clever when they're actually writing their personal statement, they could be scripting their own interview. Most of the questions they're going to be asked, particularly initially, are going to be based around information they've put in that statement. So if someone is unable to actually expand on questions, there's going to be real concerns that, did they really undertake that experience? What steps have you taken to really find out that you want to be a doctor? Oh, I've done a lot of work experience and volunteer work. Yeah. Vague answers are the same as no answer, really. You're not giving anything. The interviewer is spending time to understand you, your motivations. They want to get to, to, to know you better and therefore see what your potential is. If you just give a vague answer, it's very difficult for them to make that judgment. It's really important um, to expand on your answers. The interview is the time to sell yourself, really. OK, Harry, moving on to more of an ethical question. Um, do you think NHS doctors and staff should be looking after private patients? Uh, um, I'm not really sure, actually. Um, I don't know. Uh, maybe, yeah. It's really important to understand what's going on in the world because it impacts how every organisation is doing. Um, it's actually a question that I specifically ask at the end of every interview is um, about what a candidate has recently read that's interested them about financial services. So it's really important, even if it's from something that you've read in a fashion magazine or that you've seen on a website, really important to know what's going on out there. Yeah, I'd expect somebody to be aware of their environment, to understand and know what's going on. I wouldn't necessarily ask for a sort of political persuasion or anything like that, but, but a general understanding of what's going on within the community, within their environment. I think that's important. Do you think NHS doctors and staff should be treating private patients? Well, it's a very hotly debated topic. Is it right for private patients to have priority over the NHS patients who are not paying? Uh, that's something which needs to be thought about a little bit. At current, it seems that the overall consensus is that yes, they are allowed to have precedence over the non-paying patients. But however, the NHS will benefit from this um, as they will receive the extra costs of the private patients have to pick up there. We're always looking for whole people. Uh, we, we don't assess the answers that we're getting on more general questions, but it's important for people to show that they are interested, that they have got a general level of awareness of what's happening in the world. Can you perhaps tell me about some significant advances you've read about in science or in medicine? Well, it's been a lot really, isn't it? Um, lots of stuff. Read every day in the papers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, it allows us to get a flavour of them as a person. So what is it that makes them tick? What are they really interested in? I recently have read a study on a, a cancer drug named cetuximab, um, which is a really interesting thing, just to, and the action of it on the, um, the body. However, it's, it's been found that tumours actually become resistant towards um, cetuximab 
um, and that's a very interesting field of research in oncology which has really interested me recently. Can, can you give an example of a situation where you've supported a friend in difficult circumstances and what issues they faced and how you helped them? Um, sorry, could you repeat the question? Oh, sure. If can you, you don't understand the question that somebody's asked you, it's really silly to try and answer it, not knowing what they're, they're looking for. It's much better to ask them to, to rephrase or to, to ask the question again in a different way. Similarly, if someone asks you a really tricky question, they might not be expecting an immediate answer. So do take a moment to think about it and construct your answer. It, it'll make you a much more uh, confident and strong candidate. OK. You, uh, have you got any questions for us? Um, no. no, I don't think so, no. For me, that shows a level of disinterest. When you're preparing for the interview, you could select questions at that point, but also those general questions that you could ask at the end of any interview. Um, and a really good one that I always think is, do you have any reservations about me at this point? Because it gives you the opportunity to answer anything that they may be thinking. It is important to ask questions. This really is your last chance to impress and it shows that you've prepared for your interview, even if it is just one question. So I was just wondering, do you encourage students to take rotations abroad? The biggest thing to stand out from the crowd is to be yourself because everybody is different. So if you go in and show your own personality and just relax into an interview, then that's how you'll stand out. If you're prepared, you can anticipate some of the questions that are going to be asked um, and you can display confidence in your answers and give a breadth of experience, um, then it, it shouldn't be a daunting, necessarily that you know, overly daunting experience, but it's all about the preparation. Specific and generic. Specific is when it becomes more technical, um, and that's when you need to have the knowledge. It's very important the knowledge and application. As I said, this is the formula you need to have to become that wow student. Not just a good student or an excellent student, but to become that wow student that gets chased by universities. Okay, um, we, uh, I went through this with the students this morning. Um, we will go straight to now. Um, information for parents, which I like to just talk about this strategic global pathway. So this is what we do um, at OIC, that we don't just prepare students for the UK. So all my engineers are looking to apply to UK universities as well as US and other parts of the world. So there's a very strategic pathway for every student. So uh, for example, my engineers are looking to apply to Oxbridge, MIT and Caltech or any other university in the US. Um, I also have medical students who apply to Australia, Ireland, Hong Kong University, Singapore University and sort of thing. So um, the preparation is similar. By the way, are you aware that Thai University also asks for BVAT? Yeah. So lots of universities now are subscribing to the same admission test that are done in the UK. Singapore University is subscribing to the same admission test. So admission test is becoming so, so, so crucial, as I said to you earlier on. Um, this is the integrated curriculum. So you've got academic, career, personal development. And this is the reason why, uh, this is the formula that has worked for the last 14 years. All I've done is I've changed it slightly. So in the past, it wasn't one plus two plus three. The formula was more. Um, the results was the first thing, and then two plus three. But now it's changed. One is admissions test, two is interview, and three is that, the whole application. Um, next one, please. Okay, so just to give you an idea, I've already explained this anyway. So this is what we do at OIC. So the number of hours that we do per subject, we do 26 hours per week. Science practicals, two to six hours. We don't believe in homework, we believe in assessment. So we operate a six day timetable. So students, instead of doing homework, they can get assessment every Saturday, Saturday. So we believe in that as a six day curriculum because in that six day, I have to cover all three aspects. So six day doesn't mean that they are studying all the time. 
If you go to a traditional boarding school in the UK, you will study from 9 to 4 or 9 to 5 or whatever the time is. Every evening, 7 till 9, you have prep. Prep means you sit there and you do your homework. Right? Now, I don't believe in that concept. So what I've done is I've changed it to 7 till 9. Instead of doing prep, they're doing this or this or this. They're doing one of these. So instead of prep, they're doing these things. So the amount of time that they spend in the school is exactly the same time in a boarding school. Exactly the same time. The only difference is I've changed the formula. That's all. Because the formula in the UK is prep in the evening, Saturdays is extracurricular and sort of thing. I have embedded everything into six days. So it's the same amount of time as students in a boarding school. All our teachers have come from Oxford University, 100% are either Oxford University graduates or full PhD degrees. Um, I have to say one thing, when my students move from Cardiff to, because when I moved from Cardiff to college to OIC, uh, quite a number of students had moved across as well. And my students normally comment, and they say that um, at Cardiff they had to learn the definitions but at OIC, they actually understand the definitions. So that's a, it's a great uh, learning tool because the teacher's level are actually very, very, very good. Uh, small class sizes, and as I said earlier on, we are third in the league table for Sixth Form College and fifth as co-ed boarding school. This is um, something that I'm very proud of because we are the only school in the UK that actually delivers, delivers this. So as I said, we do six hours of admission test every week. We do two hours of bridging program. This is done throughout the year. This one is done weekly. This is done weekly. All that is your career preparation. So everything from bridging course to Oxbridge mentorship, final project qualification, enrichment trips. We, we do four weeks of placements in the UK. And we've obviously got the university prep curriculum. So in total, you get eight hours um, a week. Personal development, as I said here, I, we do have extra curricula, but we focus a lot on super curricula, and again, that happens on a weekly basis. We do two to three hours per week on every enrichment classes, and the idea of the enrichment classes is to help them with problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, ability to communicate, and so on. Next one, please. What does it mean by having the right attitude? Sorry, can you go back? Um, if you look at that, 91% is expected for you to have the right attitude. What does it mean by having the right attitude? Next one. Self-discipline, patience, confidence, and resilience, effective study skills. That is what it means by having the right attitude. You have to demonstrate these personal skills, but how you demonstrate this is through the activities you do here and here. Next one. Right, so for example, as I said, coding, Philosophy, critical thinking, so coding and philosophy, critical thinking are super curricular activities. Clubs, arts, sports and music are extracurricular activities. And as I said, we do two to four hours of enrichment sessions and weekly extracurricular activities. Next one. Okay, so um, those of you who are looking to choose the right school, first of all, you need to make sure you choose the right qualifications. Make sure you know that this one is A-level, IV or pre-U. Choose the right one because if you're doing IB, for example, you're doing six subjects, do you have time to prepare for admissions test? Do you have time to do all these things? That's another thing you have to look at. Theory of knowledge in IB is very good, but you still have to prepare for admissions test. Um, if you do choose A-level, make sure you choose the right category within the qualification. There are many different categories. For example, linear, modular exam boards. You have to choose the right one. Does your school offer career curriculum and university prep? Everybody says they offer university prep. You need to grill down exactly what they offer. Does your school offer personal development programs? And that is not just music, sports, and arts. It's going to be beyond that. Next one, please. Okay, this is a summary. So you've got to make sure you develop your plan, excel academically this is for the students, explore your subject, thoroughly prepare, and grow and develop. This is how you become that wow student, not just a good student. Remember what I said earlier on, a good student is somebody who comes, attends all their classes, does their work and sort of thing. That's brilliant, but then you're just a routine. You're just going through a routine. You don't have any passion, you're just going through a routine. Excellent student is somebody 
that if I give you 10 questions, you do 20 questions, you go the extra mile, but you're still going through a routine. The wow student is somebody who is a chaser. That means that student will be chased by the university. That wow student is somebody who demonstrates every single element here, all combined in one person. And that is how you can be a wow student. Uh, this is just information about our boarding. So that's our boarding house. Um, we have lots of house parents and wardens. Um, we have students placed into four different um, houses, Azura, Redox, Blackwell, Spires. Uh, it's a really nice place, it's en suite, you have your own room, you don't share with anyone. Um, and they have lots of house competitions as well. Um, next one. A boarding and sports facilities, so those are the, how the rooms look like. Uh, we share the facilities with Oxford University for sports and music as well. Um, um, and with the sports facilities, um, well, I normally, and like I said to the students this morning, I normally tease my students that when you go for your training, you never know you could be next to a future prime minister, British Prime Minister. Because Oxford University has produced 27 Prime Ministers. So, uh, so yeah, when they go for their gym training, uh, and in the Oxford University sports facilities are very, very good. Very, very good. Um, by the way, has anyone been to Oxford? It's a very rich town, as in like Oxford City itself and Cambridge City. It's, um, it's one of the, I mean, the, the university owns almost the whole town. And everywhere you go is a university college. Because um, there are 30 colleges in Oxford and 30 colleges in Cambridge. Okay, next one. Okay, this is admissions process. I won't bore you with this. If you are interested, you can come and talk to me about it. We are a very small school. We are about 110 students. Um, I can't deliver this. I can't deliver all this if we were a large school. For example, there is no way I can do four weeks of work experience if I have 300 students. It's impossible. I couldn't do that in college. So all I see, um, we actually, um, all the students have four weeks of work experience. So what I mean to say is that every student has a career mentor who is specialist in their field. So what that means is that the students are being taught by a mentor from that particular field. So a medical student will be taught by a doctor from Oxford University, a uh, engineer, a student wants to do engineering will be taught by an engineer, a lawyer will be taught by law. I can't provide that service if I had such a big school. Um, as an organization, we are quite large. OIC has schools abroad in Switzerland and in China. OIC also has Oxford Summer Academy. Those of you in year 12, I would recommend, or year 10, okay, I would recommend you to come to our Summer Academy. Our Summer Academy prepares you a little bit of this in two or four weeks. Um, so year 10, it'll be good for you to have an understanding of which career pathway you want to go into. So we actually help you during the Summer Academy. And also for the year 12, there's a special program for year 12 students. Um, it's run at Oxford University. You are taught by Oxford University mentors and you get the whole Harry Potter experience because you live in Oxford University College. Okay, so you get the whole Harry Potter experience if you want that. But if you're looking for a Harry Potter school, then we are not that. Because I can't give you, I can't give you the greenery and the grass and the big mansion and the castle and beautiful paintings. I can't give you that. I can give you a very specific and specialized structural strategical way of getting to university. I cannot give you 800 years of history. That is just not me. I can't do that. So none of us can do that. So if you're looking for history, if you're looking for tradition, if you're looking for the castle view and all that. By the way, I have to tell you that most of these buildings have very bad maintenance and heating. Okay, we want to get out of that. We want to go into modern style buildings, okay? So, so the fact that people from overseas, when they come over and they're like, beautiful, and I said, you want to come and go and live in there? <laughs> Heating always breaks down, the plumbing is always a problem. Oh, let me, I can't, I, I, if I start telling all the issues, it will be a problem. Right, okay. Um, also, uh, this is a new thing that we are starting, uh, because we have noticed a lot of students are not really sure of their career pathway. So as soon as a student um, is, is becomes our student, that means enrolled at our college, before they arrive to our college, throughout the, let's say, let's say you get enrolled in January and you were to start in September, then during that nine months, we will 
give, we will actually start locating you with a mentor. And that mentor will be specific in your field. And that mentor will start speaking to you on the Skype and start um, um, helping you with these elements. So when you arrive in September, you have all this, you know, all the, as much as possible, you have enough, a uh, little bit of knowledge before you arrive. So, um, so what happens is as soon as you arrive, you at least have a clear awareness of what to do and what you need to do for the next two years of your A-level if you were to choose to come to OIC. So this is something we're just starting now because we have seen a lot of students who are actually not sure, they don't choose the right subject, they come to our college and then they're still not sure and at least we have to like uh, train them and gear them and sort of thing. So we are starting this a new thing. So as soon as they enroll, they get a mentor straight away. The mentor is specialist in their career. So it could be an engineer, it could be a lawyer, and sort of thing. It's not an academic mentor. We're not talking about maths and chemistry and biology and physics. We're talking about their career pathway. And if they're not sure what they want to do, they can speak to several mentors over Skype. Um, and then obviously when they come over, they will have a clearer picture. And if students want to change courses, want to change their career plan, it's absolutely fine as long as you do the right subjects. I had a girl this year, started in January, wanting to do medicine. By the end, in May, she changed to engineering. She's just got her offer from Imperial, and now she's waiting for Cambridge. So just to give you an idea. So you can change. The reason why you can change is because of our bridging program. You can try different uh, bridging programs. You can go into an economics class. You can go into a law class. You can go into a medical session. You can go into an engineering session. And then you can decide, this is for me or this is not for me. And obviously when you do the practical application things, you'll also be able to decide. When you do work experience, when you go for voluntary work, you'll be able to decide as well. Okay, so I think that um, brings me to the end. I hope, if anything you can take out of today's session, I hope the one thing that you can take, and I've told this to the students, I hope that you can take that A, aim high, that's very, very important. I hope that each one of our children aim high. Um, a lot of people ask me, I have my son is four years old. A lot of people say to me, my students normally say to me, oh, you, you must want your son to go into Cambridge and do medicine or go to become an astronaut and stuff. And I always say to them, no, if my son chooses to be a rock star, as long as my only condition is be the best rock star. <laughs> you know, be the best rock star. You know, as long as he chooses, because whatever you choose, although, by the way, I'm not recommending you to be a rock star, I'm just saying that. That was just... Uh, Theoretical, <laughs> right, okay? But I'm just giving an example. Whatever you choose in life, as long as you aim high, get to the best universities because, um, I've told this to the students and I'll tell the parents, obviously you know this already, there are two points in life where you have to compete. One is getting into university and the other point is when you, after you graduate, when you're applying for a job. So your children are at the first stage where they have to compete. And this is the stage. That is the stage of getting to university. So at this stage, that is why your education should be more specific, more narrow, more focused. If you want the whole Harry Potter shabang, then this is not the stage to do that. Right? This is not the stage where you're going to say, oh yes, let's go and explore this and explore that. It is not the stage for exploration. This is the stage of being more strategic about your plans and then working it out because this is the time when you're going to be competing. The next point you're competing is after you graduate when you're applying for jobs. The better the universities, the more likely you will get training placements. It is not about the quality of education. LSE has one of the lowest student satisfaction in the country. LSE is 108 as student satisfaction. Number one in the country is Coventry. But if you go to LSE, you're more likely to get a training placement compared to Coventry. Please don't record that and do not tell Coventry that. <laughs> but I get just an idea. Yes? Okay? So um, so if you if you so the better the university, the more likelihood you'll get better training placements as well. Especially as international students. You must not, if you go to schools in the UK, please don't compare yourself with your British counterparts. Do not do that. I'm talking to fellow Navy population. You do not want to compare yourself to British students. They have a different route, a different pathway, a different system. It's much tougher for us 
uh, coming as international students, as Asians, going to the abroad and wanting to make our mark. You have to work 10 times harder. It's the, always the case. So if you are studying in UK schools, do not compare yourself with your British counterparts. They have a different route. So for example, they can take gap years, they can apply to university, and they will still get good training placements. We are limited, we have lots of restrictions. Therefore, we must always um, try to do our best the first time round. And if it doesn't work out, then you try again, obviously. But always try to do your best from day one. Anyway, I think I've overwhelmed you with lots and lots of information. You might not be able to sleep tonight, I'm sorry about it, but as I said to the students earlier on, my job here is to bring you out of your comfort zone into a learning zone. Uh, so I'm hoping that I've been able to do that. I'm hoping that I've been able to get you out of your comfort zone into a learning zone. I do not want you to go, become panic because that means you'll be stressed. Stress is no good, but pressure is good. Dealing with pressure is a good thing, but becoming stressed is a bad thing. So, um, so yes, and I have. I want to thank Krutu for inviting me. We have lots of students that have come from Krutu that are studying. I, I actually, um, I've known Krutu for the last 10 years, and I've had students coming to Cardiff some College, which is my uh, original school, and now they're coming to OIC. Um, and um, as far as I can tell, the students are very happy at OIC, uh, but I'm sure Krutu will know more. Uh, but um, yeah, so I've had a very long relationship with Krutu and I'm always willing to help his students, regardless of whether they are um, at uh, my college or not, as much as I can. I'm more than happy to help. Krupong normally sends me uh, information about students that he would like me to help and sort of thing. So I'm more than happy to help as much as I can um, uh, because you know it's been great knowing Krutu and, and it's been a, such a great relationship for the past 10 years. So thank you very much, Krutu, for inviting me. I think we should thank. We should just give him a round of applause for all the great work that he does. <laughs>